Father, we stand in your presence again by means of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, asking that the Spirit might take charge, stripping away error and deceit, but sealing to our heart the truth of, of your word, that we might see more and more of the wonder, the greatness, the grace of our God, that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we are studying together through the epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were at verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 14. Paul has pointed out uh, through the leading of the Holy Spirit that God has him there by uh, God's power and by God's placement. I want you to know that my affairs have been to the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. doesn't matter what happens to me. God did it. And he did it to further or to advance the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is done in such a way that his bonds have been obviously made apparent that they are in Christ. The authorized version says, so that my bonds in Christ are made apparent. What that's saying is that what has been made apparent is that his bonds are in Christ. He's not in prison because he killed somebody. He's not in prison because he threatened the life of Caesar. He's not in prison because he stole some money or that he was involved in any legal uh, disobedience of any kind. It's now manifestly apparent that he's where he is first, first and foremost by God's appointment and God's design. And secondly, because of Christ. If, if any of you suffer, let him suffer as a Christian. And there are many who profess to be suffering for Christ who, I believe, bring it on themselves. Uh, if you study carefully Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's a great book that I got a hold of back when I was younger in the Lord. And, and it was once I, I picked it up and started reading it, I couldn't put it down. You know, of course, our emotions are touched with those who bravely died for their testimony. Yet many of them apparently committed suicide. Daniel did not rush into the presence of the king and say, Hey, I just heard that you signed a law that nobody can pray, so I'm going to just kneel right here and, and pray right in front of you. You know, he didn't do that. I mean, God has cautioned us against putting God to the test. And what's apparent in Paul's life is that God has placed him there. He's not there because he did anything foolish. He's not there because there's any reasonable charge against him. He's there because of Christ. It's quite apparent in the text that there were those who had suggested that Paul could have easily been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. And it also seems apparent from what we can gather from history that Rome really didn't know what to do with Paul. In fact, what we find out is they were afraid to set him free because of what might happen in the, in the repercussions in the area of Palestine. They realized he wasn't worthy of death, but he cost taxpayers to keep him. And the lesser of the two evils, you know, after several years, I don't know how many years, a few years, uh, it was just, you know, uh, to put him to death. You know, was was the simplest thing to do. And then just forget about it. You know, just one man isn't worth an uprising. So it's apparent in the life of Paul that he's not suffering because he's done anything wrong. That comes across very clear in the text. But because of Christ, not only is that true in the palace guard, the praetorian guard, I mean, and, and I want you to know that's, that's something like 10,000 plus people. I mean, and these were hand-picked men. This, this was not the common soldier. They were the best. And that they were, that these were people who were not uneducated. I don't know that we can take the text and say that every one of those, those 10,000 people had heard about Paul. Paul. 
although I'm as certain as I can be that you could take the text that way if you wanted to. We've got to try to grasp what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Now, I've sat around for several days meditating on this passage. I, I did not want to move on to new ground here in our study without first really looking at Paul sitting in that prison, the reason why he was there, the effect, the nature, the result of, of why, why he was there, or what, it, what came about as a result of him being there. This touches on a, ver a central nerve, okay, in, in our, what I believe is, is our central nervous system, uh, uh, the central nervous system of our spiritual life. It really, folks, is important that we understand how Paul addressed the subject of suffering for his sake, okay? I think that's extremely important. It's, it's so important, I believe, that I thought it was worth taking the time, not trying to rush through this, but taking some more time to look at Paul and his predicament. I mean, when you consider three or four guards a day assigned to guard Paul, I mean, what to watch him talk, to spy on him, basically, is basically what they did. Uh, to hear what he says to those who came and went. We have clear testimony, not only in the scriptures, but what we can find in history, that, that Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, he had been provided many, many privileges. And so he had people come and go. And surely those soldiers were not totally silent about what they saw and heard in Paul. Man, man, you ought to see this guy, his attitude. You ought to hear what he says. You ought to, you ought to see how he takes the condition, you know, how he deals and manages, you know, the condition that he's in. The problem with, uh, with Israel and Babylon, and, and I may be reading Isaiah wrong, But I hear God say, the reason his name was blasphemed in Babylon was not because of what the Babylonians were doing, but because of what his people were doing, grumbling and complaining all the time about their, their situation and their, about their condition. You know, what a marvelous testimony it would have been if, if had Israel in captivity in Babylon said, you know, we're here because God feels it's best for us. You know, you know, we as a nation, we went into idolatry, you know, really wandering far from God, and he drove us here into captivity. You know, boy, has that been good for us. I mean, did, did they know, did they know that they were being brought back to the Lord? You know, uh, that their attention was being fo again focused on the Lord, you know, and and you know, and and I, I can just, I can just, I can almost imagine, you know, and we're thinking about sacrifices at the temple. Wouldn't that have been marvelous testimony? But they didn't do that. The first thing they did was enter into a Babylonian activity in society. They they basically become like the people that they were around. You know, a good company, bad company corrupts good morals, as they say, as as we read, I think, in Proverbs. Uh, and the second thing that they did was complain to God about their situation, rather than than actually praise His name. In contrast to that, what we see under grace, grace, okay, is Paul is singing in a Philippian jail cell. I mean, what what possible problem could there be in your life that he doesn't go through with you and me? He says he's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. There's a lot that's been written, many, many, many sermons that have been preached on whether or not Paul was out of the will of the Lord when he went to Jerusalem. It's apparent that Paul is where God put him. 
And the first thing he was told is, I will show him how many great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, so many messages, sermons, I, I, I have articles that I've read, television, late night television, you know, Daystar type uh, sermons, driving down the road in my truck, listening to to sermons on the radio, uh, and and I and I'll I'll hear ministers of what they claim to be ministers of the gospel, and I'll hear them talking about how that Paul was just out of the will of the Lord. You know, he was out of the will of the Lord when he went to Jerusalem. You know, it's apparent that Paul is is where God put him. If you if you look at the text and take just read it at face value, it's apparent. It's obviously apparent that Paul was where God wanted him to be. And the first thing he was told is, or the first thing that he knew, I'm sure, was that he had to suffer for the sake of Christ. So many sermons nowadays, they, they promote this idea, folks, that if, if your life is right, it's if it's dedicated to serving faithful without sin and God's going to bless you, everything's going to be fine. And as I study the scriptures, I never see that. I don't ever see that. I see a man whose wife left him, who lost all his wealth, you know, who now sits in a prison with a guard appointed to him 24 hours a day around the clock for the testimony of Christ. And it seems to me in modern Christianity, the obvious conclusion would be that Paul was out of the will of the Lord and living in sin, or these things wouldn't be true. And I think there's there are those on the street that were out, that were free about, you know, going about preaching the gospel, not another gospel, but the gospel, uh, who believed that Paul was deserved to be where he was because he was he was he wasn't there because God placed him there he was there because of the sin in his life you know he's obviously he's not living the victorious Christian life I don't see that mindset in the heart of Paul why is the Holy Spirit telling me this if if I'm to look at Paul as out of the will of the Lord and and, and this mess all a result of his willful sin then the Holy Spirit ought to be telling me this, but he's not telling me this. In fact, it, it is, it's more like, now listen, I don't want anybody to think that way. I want you to know, I want you to fully understand that my affairs have advanced the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything else that can be compared with that. You know, I want you to know I'm not here because I'm living in willful sin. I'm here because it advanced the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only did it do that, and all the Praetorian Guard, that's 10,000 picked men, but in all the rest of the palace, my Bible says in all other places. But that's not the picture that we want. The idea today is that we need to bring the gospel into our prisons to save those who are there, who are only where they are because they are bad people. They're bad. They sin. Now, and I, now, before you, please don't send me any emails saying, Steve, are you saying that we shouldn't send ministers into the prisons to preach to the gospel to the inmates? No, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, I don't know how can I how can I don't need, I just I'm, sometimes I'm at a loss of work. The idea today is that we need to bring the gospel into, into prisons to save those who are there, okay? You know, who are only there because, you know, they messed up their life. Now, that's no, da no doubt. That is true in most cases. It might be, you might say that that's true in most cases. At least from from the human perspective, they are there because of of what they did wrong. You know, I I happen to believe that if you are a child of God and you're in prison, you're there because God wants wanted you there. Even if it was some crime that you committed to put you there, 
the point I'm trying to make is a simple one. It's I, I don't want to get too overcomplicated with this, but that was not true in the case of Paul. And when it comes to God's people in prison today, we, we are reluctant to say that they are only in prison because God placed them there. You know, they are his people in whom all things work together for the good because they love God and are, and are called according to his purpose. No place in the word of God, no place do I see God using that as a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Had it been done the way man plans it, Christ wouldn't have been born of a virgin in a manger. You know, he, he, he'd have been born of some queen living in a palace, you know, where he rode a white horse into Jerusalem. You know, I... You know, when I'm riding a horse, folks, I, th I think of the donkey Christ rode on. When I think of, of one being bound, as Paul was, in bonds to preach the gospel, I think of the prison where God placed Paul. Those preaching Christ, not another gospel. They were, they're preaching Christ. The text makes it clear they're preaching Christ. But they're doing so for personal gain, thinking to add to Paul's affliction. Did they do this thinking Paul was in prison, uh, one, because he sinned, and two, not realizing God had placed Paul there for the advancement of the gospel? You know, kind of like, man, that Paul, he didn't have to be so, so bold. He could have been a bit more discreet, but no, uh, no, here he is. He's causing more, uh, of the, he caused a big ruckus to begin with, but now here he is. He's causing more of the brethren to be as dangerously bold as he is preaching the word of God without fear. How much are we going to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel? if we're preaching Christ out of selfish ambition. Because it doesn't seem that we would be preaching the word of God without fear, like, like the others that Paul refers to. Verse 14, And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They were going to speak the word of God without fear even more because they were strongly persuaded the gospel was advancing despite Paul's present circumstances. Can we say the same about ourselves today? Verse 16 the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. And if we keep reading in 17, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. You know, it's almost, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to get a picture of this, and to me, it's, it's like, it's almost like, who are you to be preaching Christ, says those preaching Christ without sincerity. While, while Paul rejoices in them preaching Christ without sincerity. That's interesting. Because the gospel itself, the very nature of it, is rooted in the sovereignty of God. My Bible tells me that the true minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things unto this day, despised and rejected and hated, that being defamed, we entreat. 1 Corinthians 4.13. But that's not what I see. What I see, dearly beloved, is popularity that staggers my imagination. And I hear it said, well, that's the way Christ does it. I don't see that. I see Zechariah alone and down in a pit. I see Isaiah concerned. I see Daniel virtually alone. You know, seeing friends disappear. Oh, he was in high places, but it was a lonely life. 
I see Christ meek and lowly. I see Paul in prison. I see Peter crucified upside down, in fact, and, and John run through with a lance. I don't see what people tell me I ought to be seeing. Now I hear the Holy Spirit say that it's for the advancement of the gospel resulting in Christ being magnified in my body. If the gospel of Jesus Christ were advanced by power and prestige and dignity and popularity, well, then who needs the Holy Spirit? Who needs the power of God? And how would the glory and the praise go to God? But what about a prisoner under sentence of death who has no money, Who's, who's being guarded daily by soldiers, doesn't face any prospect of liberty. Now there's a great testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That must be the power of God. You know, Christ didn't write any books. You know, uh, he didn't travel more than 100 miles. Uh, 120 miles north and south and 90 miles east and west all of his life. We know, folks, it's not by might nor by strength, but by, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. My bonds are now absolutely apparent to me, says Paul, because of Christ. Paul was not there because of sin or because of disobedience. It is apparent to everybody, I mean, to a select guard and to all the rest of the palace, that he's there. It is apparent to them that he's there because of Christ. Now, since that's true, most of the brethren wax confident. That is, they, they, they become persuaded, says the Greek. They become persuaded by his bonds. Whereas there were some who were not going to uh, wax confident by that guy, Paul, going to prison. You know, maybe they imagined Paul, you know, walking up to the Roman emperor, grabbing him by the coat lapels and, and demanding to be heard. You know, I, I don't know. Most of the brethren are persuaded by my bonds, but I can see how others wouldn't have been persuaded by that man's bonds. Maybe they love the Lord with all their heart, but I don't see where God's word counsels us to, see, to, to think something as sacred as the gospel is something that is driven by self-will, self-righteousness, self-power, or self-gain. How does one preach the gospel without sincerity for the sake of self-gain and preach it without fear? You know, there's something about, in the, about the innocency of Paul in this situation that the Holy Spirit wants us to see. that none of these brethren are accusing Paul of being there because of willful, willful sin or foolishness or disobedience. They are persuaded by his bonds. They know that Paul went to prison because of what he preached, not because of what he did, but of what he proclaimed. The Jews didn't, they didn't put Paul in prison because of anything he did, but because of what he preached. In fact, when they arrested him, he was doing everything they wanted him to do. When they arrested him, they just, they just said, there's that man, that, there's that rabble rouser, you know, and they arrested him in the temple when he was doing exactly what they wanted him to do. So his bonds in Christ are not a result of his actions, but of what he proclaimed in Christ. And that caused many of the brethren to be persuaded to, to preach that gospel, to speak the word of the word of the God, says the text, without fear. Notice what they preach. The word of God. And that doesn't mean that, you know, that we have, well, that doesn't mean 14 canned sermons on a shelf that we preach over and over, you know, or whatever, you know, and we call that study. How can you preach the Word of God if you don't know the Word of God? They proclaim the Word of God without fear. 
there are certain things churches today just couldn't preach because if they if they did, their congregations would evaporate. They need, you know, between 800 and 900, who knows how many people there every Sunday morning in order to get a collection big enough to support all of this investment in property and equipment. You know, you, you got to make sure that, that what you say is as, as close to the truth as you can possibly get it without scaring people away or offending people, driving people away, because you need the offering to meet the budget. That can be preaching Christ out of contention. I can't help think of the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that we are not like most Christians who corrupt the Word of God, who use the Word of God deceitfully and for gain. They preached the Word of God fearlessly. It didn't matter whether most of the congregation evaporated or not. In John chapter 6, I read that when Christ preached, most of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Does that mean they went to hell? I don't I don't think they went to hell. I think they were redeemed people. I think they were followers of Christ, but they just couldn't follow that close. And that's what I see in Christianity today. Too difficult to study. Too much work to digest the book. You know, we have to say it in such a way that we get this, the, the amens and the hallelujahs and the support of the congregation. I believe that you can develop a scriptural thesis that any popular acceptance of the message is, is a clear indication that it's not true. It's not true. If, if this message were popular, they wouldn't, you wouldn't need the, you would need the, the words uh, without fear here in the text. Why put that there? Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You know, pardon my foolishness here, but, but suppose a voice came down from heaven and, and said, Steve, this is the Lord speaking. I've got such wonderful good news for you to proclaim. You know, of course, you're in the Bible Belt, so, you know, there's no really no need for us to talk about all that, you know, all that suffering, you know, all that stuff about pro proclaiming the gospel in boldness and without fear and all that. You know, I mean, you know, since you live in a red state as well, you know, or am I, am I to understand from our present study that it's not just about fear of prison or fear of death, though that might occur, but that the very nature of the very message of the gospel is going to be often met with opposition. You know, even right here in nowhere, Oklahoma, Oh, I couldn't preach that, Steve. I, you know, if I did, I'd lose all my followers. Well, first of all, I don't have any followers. You're not my followers. You're God's people. Paul knew these things. You don't stand or fall to me, folks. You stand or you fall to God. Your responsibility is to him and to his word. You are commanded to give diligence to rightly divide this book, not handle it deceitfully. Why should these men, whoever these brethren are, proclaim the true word of the God without fear? Because it's a fearful thing to proclaim it. It was then, it is today. I believe that with all my heart. If you really proclaim what this book says, dearly beloved, that can be a fearful experience. Unless... We modify the message so that it's popular, so it, it gets so so it gets to the masses which we attract by bait and deceit, where we act like salesmen. Basically, that's basically what we're doing, you know. And, and goal setting engineers rather than ambassadors for Christ, they proclaimed it without fear. 
clearly I get in the verse that associated with a proclamation of God's word is danger, and they did it fearlessly. Some indeed proclaim Christ. They do it by means of envy and strife. Others do it from goodwill. Now, the, the authorized version interchanges verses 16 and 17, so I'm going to do it the way the Greek does it. The one preached Christ out of love, absolutely persuaded that I've been appointed for the defense of the gospel. The Holy Spirit makes it very clear to us that God chose Paul and appointed him to a life of suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't think it's his trial in Caesar's court. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying that Paul's entire experience has been appointed by God for the proclamation and the defending of the good news of Jesus Christ. Some preach Christ with impure motives, supposing to add affliction to his bonds. You know, the word there is pressure in the Greek. Not, not that it's going to be an emotional, spiritual, mental affliction. You know, a, a pressure that's added to Paul because they're out there preaching with impure motives. And, well, he's wanting to be out there preaching in sincerity to sort to counterbalance that. That's... And it's an easy conclusion to reach that we have that what we're looking at here is two kinds of preaching. One where Christ is truly preached and the other where a false gospel is preached. And Paul gives thanks for both. OK. So. I can't do that. Many of the commentators do that. I can't do that. One could preach truth because he loves God and he wants to proclaim the truth of the Word of God. One could preach truth because the only job he could get was a church that needed somebody to preach. You know, I suppose one could preach Christ just because it, it looks like a really good, man, that's, that's a really good birth. I mean, people respect you. They respect the ministry. You can get a discount on air travel, you know, train travel. You have special tax breaks, you know, you know, well, at least you did up until this year. And, and I'm going to preach Christ because the position of a minister, it just, it just ain't too bad. I mean, you know, a lot of respect goes along with that. And uh, there's, some, there's a few perks. And, you know, I believe the context absolutely demands that we realize both of these categories of Christians are preaching the truth. Now, I, you know, I look at my own life. You know, I'm not sitting in Caesar's dungeon. You know, I get a few negative comments on a video and I think, ooh, I'm so persecuted. You know, but that's another video. I am absolutely convinced that the gospel I preach is the gospel that Paul preached. But I'm not in prison. And, and neither, you know, likely are you, if you're hearing me. But we are exactly, folks, where God has placed us for the advancement of the gospel. The question could be asked, if one of us were preaching Christ out of selfish ambition or self-glory, would the prisoner Paul be rejoicing? And the text forces me to say yes. Maybe he, Christ is just that important. It doesn't add any pressure, as, as we'll see in our, in our next video, our next study here. The difference, folks, was Paul's implicit trust in God's sovereign will over his life. A truth that lies at the very heart of the gospel that he preached. The sum and the substance of the gospel. The gospel of Christ is rooted in the sovereign will and grace of God. We get to chapter 2 and verse 12. We're going to read, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, why? Because it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I want to take a moment to thank you so much 
for your support of this ministry, for the, the prayers that I receive, the emails, the messages, the comments that you leave. I um, know that I'm praying for you constantly. I love you all dearly. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.